Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I'm Emeritus Professor Glenn McConnell. Today I'm bringing to you Professor Gregoire Mier from the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. He has a very interesting background, been a former elite triathlete and a coach of elite triathletes, but he's also had an, a remarkable scientific career with around 400 peer-reviewed scientific journal articles. So his focus has been on altitude and hypoxic training and hypoxic conditioning. Most of us are aware of, you know, athletes living at altitude and training at altitude. So that's live high, train high. But for over 20 years, there's been an interest in live high, train low, which is where you either live at altitude or breathe low oxygen air, and then you exercise at sea level, so just with normal air. But um, that's actually progressed now. So that for the last 10 years or so, uh, Professor Mier and others have been looking at this concept of live high, train low, and high. So that way you actually, for example, either live high or breathe low oxygen air, and then you train with normal oxygen, but also you supplement that, for example, with repeated sprints by breathing hypoxic air. So that's live high, train low, and high. And that's particularly of interest for um, intermittent sports, so team type sports. We also talked about um, his interest in using hypoxia and also hyperoxia, which is high oxygen, um, in, in treatments for people with hypertension and peripheral arterial disease, et cetera. So hypoxia, hyperoxia for health. I think you'll really enjoy this one, so stick around. Hello, Gregoire. Welcome to Inside Exercise. Thank you for coming on at short notice. Yeah, thank you, Glenn, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to chat with you on altitude training and hypoxic conditioning. Yes, and I have to admit, I, I had to ask you how to say your name properly. So why don't you say your, your full name properly? You know? uh, I'm Grégoire Millet. So Ooh. the that you can call me Grégory Millet, but my real name is Grégoire Millet. So I'm professor of exercise and environmental physiology at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. I'm French citizen. I grew up in I, I grew up at moderate altitude, and uh -huh. I guess that's where my interest for altitude uh, came from. Okay. Well, I saw you were a French uh, tr triathlete champion, triathlon champion at one stage. So I thought, okay, Switzerland. So you, I guess you were born. Why don't you tell us your background and how you were a triathlete and coach and, and now, you know, exercise yeah. scientist, obviously. So, yeah, I, I grew up on the Jura Mountain that is uh, on the Swiss border at uh, 1,000 meters of altitude. Then I started with cross-country ski. And then later on, I moved to triathlon, where I was a professional uh, triathlete for a few years. And then after that, I moved to uh, coaching, uh, first with a French team. I was After that, I was a performance director of the British team at Sydney Olympics. Mm -hmm. And then I was advisor and coach for the Hong Kong team. Um, between 2004 and 2008, I was a senior uh, physiologist at Aspire in Qatar. Mm -hmm. where I did develop the hypoxic facility there and the uh, physiology labs. And then since uh, 2008, I'm a professor in uh, Lausanne, but I'm still working on the same topic, something I was really interested as an athlete, coach, and now uh, let's say academic, uh, that is uh, how we can use uh, altitude hypoxia uh, for some uh, benefit in athletes and now in patients. Exactly. That's something, um, yeah, I, I, have, I have probably a very narrow uh, mind because I'm focusing all the last 40 years on the same on the same thing. But obviously, as an athlete and coach, it was more about the outcome, practical outcome. And now I'm more interested about the potential mechanisms and also uh, improving the what is already existing. And that's why uh, I think we'll, we'll speak a bit later about it. Uh, about some uh, innovation coming from my lab on yes, yes. training. So, yeah, I, I mean, you sent me a couple of papers. I only had a quick look at uh, them, but, you know, the health implications, et cetera. So a lot more to it than, than what we tend to think about. And what, what I thought about at first was, you know, altitude training, endurance athletes, but you, you've also, and others have been looking at for team sports, but how yeah. about, can you just set the scene? And also I want to apologize. I said on Twitter, you had 225 papers. It was on the web somewhere. You got 400 papers, <laughs> um, peer reviewed journal articles. That's amazing. Um, can you just set the scene a little bit here on, um, 
you know, what actually happens when you go at altitude? And even, even before that, like, you know, the Mexico Olympics, you know, what, why that was interesting and how that may have, you know, spurned a lot of research, et cetera. Yeah, from an historical point of view, obviously, uh, investigation about altitude training starts in the 60s because of the Mexico Olympic Games in 68. But at that time, the only way to use altitude was uh, was a living high training high. That means I go to Saint Moritz in Switzerland, uh, I or you go to uh, Colorado Spring, and then you spend three four weeks living and training there. Uh, and obviously, the main advantage of uh, being 24 hours a day at altitude is that you have a long exposure to uh, altitude, and uh, it's a very important uh, parameter. How long you stay there? The second parameter is how high you have mm -hmm. to be, and the third one that is less frequently uh, uh, taken into account is the intermittence. Is it the same to spend, let's say, three weeks uh, continuously, or is it the same to spend three weeks where I will uh, spend the three weeks with few days interspersed? So mm -hmm. intermittence is quite important because. When you have some adaptation, we'll speak about that later, when you go to altitude, but you have also some adaptation when you go back to sea level. And uh, obviously, it's not exactly the same, three weeks continuously or three weeks interspersed. Yes, yes. So we'll talk about a whole bunch of that stuff. And as you said, it started off people with mainly thinking about, um, you know, competing high, and then it became train high, live low. And I know you have an interest in live low, train high, et cetera. So yes. there's all sorts of combinations. But yeah. before you we have get- three, Sorry, you have three big families and it's still the case. So the, the first one was living high, training high. The second mm -hmm. one that was that was developed in the 90s by Professor Ben Levine and Jim Stregnerson, who was a, a medical doctor at the USA Ski. Uh, it was living high, training low. The first paper was in the 90s. And this live high train low method has been uh, worldwide uh, um, spread. You know, every now, every, um, let's say, sports center has some sleeping room, mm -hmm. including at the Australian Institute of Sport, where they had a hypoxic chamber where you can sleep in altitude, but train low. And then uh, you have the live low train high. And in the live low train high, you have a lot of different possibilities. You can live low and train high in an hypoxic chamber or using a mask system at low intensity. That's what we call continuous training in hypoxia, CTH. You can do interval training in hypoxia, what we call IHT. And you can do repeated sprint in hypoxia, what we call RSH, repeated sprint training in hypoxia. And now you have resistance training in hypoxia. And for these different methods, it's always of interest to um, discuss, is it systemic hypoxia? You go to the mountain or you go in an hypoxic chamber, so you are in a hypoxic environment, or is it localized hypoxia? You can induce localized hypoxia, for example, with blood flow restriction, with a cuff system. So you, you, in the toolbox, there are many, many tools, and obviously the expertise now for any elite coaches or any physiologist is not to discuss is one method better than the other one is how you complement and uh, how you combine these different methods for example if i go i sleep high i train low and but from time to time i train high then we can call this method live high train low and high no. you can okay. sleep high that will be mainly for erythropoietic response increase in hemoglobin mass you can train low, then would mean you get a better training quality. But from time to time, you can also do re a repeated sprint or resistance training in hypoxia for inducing some additional benefits, but mainly at the peripheral level. You know, so okay. it's quite interesting because it's much more complicated than just it is. What is what it was for at the beginning in the 60s. I go to altitude only for improving my oxygen transport capacity that is still very important right but it's not the only way to use al altitude and hypoxia okay all right there's quite a lot there to unpack um but just for people that may not be that familiar with the area can we just talk a little bit about just you know even when you just go up to altitude 
you know, people always always say, you know, even undergrad students, they'll say, oh, there's less oxygen up there. You know, they think it's less as a as a percentage, but yes. it's actually the same percentage. But you want to just explain what happens when you go up some some basics. Yes. And then we start to unpack each of these things. So maybe what happens acutely when you go up, you know, how sure. you feel, what happens to your heart rate, your ventilation and things like that. And then we start saying, well, why would you want to do this sort of training or whatever? We'll get to that a bit later. Is that okay? Yeah. So the first point, and thanks for the question, is that uh, obviously we can have hyperbaric hypoxia. That's a real altitude. So even at the top of Mount Everest, you still have 20.93% of oxygen. What mm -hmm. makes uh, the exercise so difficult in altitude is that the barometric pressure decreases. At the top of Mount Everest, it's about one third of the barometric pressure at the at sea level, like uh, where you are now in, uh, in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the oxygen pressure, the ambient oxygen pressure is decreased to the same extent. But when you go to most of the hypoxic chamber in the world, we don't manipulate the barometric pressure. Some hyperbaric chamber can do that, but from a technological point of view, you need to get this uh, higher on, you know, metallic wall because you, mm -hmm. the, the device has to support the, the difference in pressure between mm -hmm. in and out, out of the room. But most of the, Hypoxic chambers used now in sports uh, worldwide is what we call normobaric hypoxia, NH. That means you just decrease the oxygen fraction, the oxygen percent. We yeah. know that if you are at sea level and you use 13.5% of oxygen instead of 21, you will be around 3,000, 3,500 meters of simulated altitude. We don't talk about altitude because altitude is a physical parameter mm -hmm. you know the, yes the uh, altitude is is related to sea level so we are talking in meter or mm -hmm. or feet in the us <laughs> compared to sea level while yes. hypoxia is a physiological parameter yes so so if you go up to the top of uh you know mount everest or, or as you said colorado springs or whatever you've got the same percent of oxygen but because there's less pressure each molecule is sort of further apart so, so when you breathe in each liter, you're getting less oxygen. So that's, that's normoxic. So normal oxygen, hi, um, hypobaria, hypobaric normoxia. No, it's a, it's a, it's a hypox, it's normobaric hypoxia. Oxia. So we no, don't change the barometric exactly. pressure. We change the, we oxygen. change the hypoxic level. And, uh, what is, um, of interest is that again, for long, it was thought that hyperbaric hypoxia and normal baric hypoxia would lead to the same adaptation or to the same physiological responses. And we've been working uh, over the last 10 years uh, about uh, subtle differences mm. between normal baric and hyperbaric okay. hypoxia that would clearly show, that clearly shows now that there is an, a small additional effect of decreased hypobaric, uh, decreased barometric pressure on mm -hmm. top of the hypoxic okay. Uh, okay. stress so saying, or stimulus, yes. you still have an additional hypobaric stimulus. Okay. That means uh, it's not exactly the same. Okay. So you're saying, so like, like, as you said, many labs and, you know, we'll talk about altitude tents, hypoxic tents, you know, you've got the normal pressure, obviously, because you're at sea level but then you drop the oxygen content and you're saying you actually get differences. So that, that's really interesting. Um, so that's subtle why, for example, differences. sorry, that's why for, if you want to have the same uh, responses in a, in a normal baric hypoxic facilities in a tent, you have to set the oxygen fraction as lower. it would be a bit higher. In uh, yes, altitude. a bit lower oxygen, a bit higher altitude. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. Uh, no, a bit lower fraction to simulate yes. a, a bit Higher I, altitude, I get you. you. Know, we, we calculate, we approximate like it would be two to two to three hundred meter difference. Oh wow, okay, that's quite a lot. Yeah. So, so then just just again, just to get people on the same page. So, so when you go up to altitude, or if you're bre breathing low oxygen at, at sea level, you're getting less oxygen per breath. So you have to breathe more. Um, you have to have a higher heart rate to deliver the same amount of oxygen to your muscles and various other ad adaptations. Now, what you know, what people usually think about 
and and, uh, and you, you can obviously say there's other adaptations as well, is the fact that that stimulus will then make the body want to think, okay, how am I going to increase my oxygen delivery? Sure. And one way it does that is to red, increase the red blood cell mass. Did you want to just explain yeah. how long that takes? And um, obviously how long it takes depends on how much you want it to increase, but whether sure. in, everyone increases, whether it, whether there's non-responders or not, there was talk of that at one stage uh, and that stuff like that for a bit. And then yeah. we'll, maybe yeah. we can uh, simply describe the acute response to hypoxia. To mm -hmm. first and then to discuss responder okay. versus non-responder okay. and yeah. the chronic adaptation so mm -hmm. the acute response to hypoxia just uh if you have a, a decrease in the oxygen pressure obviously that will induce a decrease in the alveolar pressure and then consequently it will modify the the different gradient of pressure at the different stage you know of, of the oxygen cascade so the first response is an hyperventilation mm -hmm. if you go to altitude after very few minutes you will have a very large increase in your minute ventilation and uh breathing uh rate yes it will lead to an increase in the alveolar pressure you know and the alveolar pressure then would the gradient between the alveolar and the capillary, the pulmonary capillary is very important for the diffusion. That's one of the, one of the first stage of the oxygen cascade. Mm -hmm. So the uh, pressure gradient has to be maintained. That's why you have this hyperventilation. But this hyperventilation has a lot of consequences. It will induce uh, respiratory al alkalosis because I will exhale a lot of CO2. It will, this respiratory alkalosis will modify the acid-base balance in my blood, and it will lead to, uh, let's say, uh, renal uh, bicarbonate excretion. And uh, if everything is okay, you should observe this increased minute ventilation, this hyperventilation, and at the end of the few days, you should observe in people who have a good chemosensitivity, you should observe also an increase in the urine loss in the, you know, in the, in your, in the diuresis. Yes. Okay. So, so you, and, and then, sorry. And then oh, it I just might, want to keep uh, it a bit simpler for people. Sorry. Sorry. Just the yeah. people, people that haven't done physiology even that. So when you're talking about the, the, the pressure, so basically you've got less oxygen in your lungs so the alveoli which is the smallest um, unit in the lung less pressure less pressure yes yes okay uh, i'm just trying to make it simple for people so because yep. there's less pressure in the in the of, of oxygen specifically in the lung and you've got to have that gradient etc um you have to breathe more to try and put the oxygen concentration slash pressure up to then try and make you know increase your oxygen transport into the blood and you will also increase your heart rate Yes. Yes. And then another thing you said just then was you'll lose fluid. So one of the things that happen is you actually lose plasma volume. So people may not know, but if you have blood and you spin it down, the yellow on top is the plasma and then the red cells at the bottom, you lose some plasma volume as well. So what, what effect does that have? So then when you measure, you might think, oh, the red blood cells have increased already, but it's, it's really not the case. It's just that you've lost some plasma volume. Is that true? Yeah. The no, plus, initially. The, the the, the the decrease in plasma volume will uh, occur a bit later not uh, it's not uh, so acute you know ah, it will okay. take it will take few days to get a uh, very significant uh, decrease in plasma volume mm -hmm. uh, the, the first thing you will observe is simply a dehydration okay. uh, during the first days at altitude because of the increased ventilation so you will have a increased water mm -hmm. loss by the respiration and yes. you will have this diuretic response to 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 uh, oh, excrete bicarbonate bicarbonate and then the risk of dehydration is very important then later on as you did explain you'll have this emo concentration decrease in plasma volume one thing that is important since the, the oxygen cascade is a bit um, more difficult you know the oxygen transport and, and so on you have also some cardiovascular responses mm. and one of them is to try to maintain the cardiac output and maintain the vo2 is increase in the heart rate 
yes. you will have an increase in cardiac output, mainly by the increase in the heart rate. And this increase in the heart rate will stay very, very long. Even when you are acclimatized, your heart rate for a given exercise intensity will be a bit higher than what you would get at sea level. Okay, so so when you go up there acutely, so just say, say you've been up for a few days and then you do like a VO2 max test or something. Um, did you want to just tell us what happens there? That it's 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 going to be lower. Uh, do you want to just explain why it's lower? With trying to keep it kind of simple, that's okay. Yes. So if yeah. you go to altitude and you are not pre-acclimatized, you just go there. Uh, on average, you will get about 7% decrease in VO2 max per every 1,000 meter of elevation. Okay. So if I go, let's say, to 3,000 meter, on average, because we can discuss later on, there's a large inter-individual variability, but okay. on average, it will be about, let's say, three times, 3,000, three times, 7%. 20%, 25% decrease in your mm. VO2 max. And it comes mainly from the convection. It comes mainly from the decrease in the oxygen transport. So if I come back to my oxygen cascade, I will have the oxygen that will go from the alveola and bind on the hemoglobin that will make oxyhemoglobin. This oxyhemoglobin will be the main way to transport oxygen down to the peri down to the muscles. And this oxyhemoglobin, um, they, th they will be uh, more difficult to have this oxygen transport uh, down because you'll have less oxygen coming from the lung. And we measure the oxygen pressure at the arterial level, that what we call PaO2. Mm -hmm. so, just, so just to give you just to give you a few numbers, at sea level, the ambient oxygen pressure is 150 millimeter of mercury. At the arterial level, it's about 195, 100 millimeter of mercury. But the more severe is the, or the more high, the, the highest is the altitude, the lower will be the alveolar and then arterial pressure of oxygen. So less oxygen will be uh, also down to the capillary in the muscle and then less oxygen available for the mitochondria. So th that's, it's affecting the whole cascade. Yes. So if you're doing submaximal exercise in this in this situation, you'd probably be okay. You just have to have a higher heart rate, higher breathing rate, to actually get that work done. But you know, and that's okay submaximally. But when you go up to max, as you've indicated, the, the main uh, limit to VO to max generally is your oxygen delivery. So you go up to your max heart rate, and you can't actually do much about it, right? Because you're at your max heart rate. And you just don't have yeah. blood uh, but, oxygen in the blood. So but when you are when you are in, when you are in altitude, your maximal heart rate is decreased. Your maximal mm -hmm. cardiac output is decreased, and oh. obviously your VO two max, as I did explain, is decreased. So, okay. so you're, you're... there is an effect. There is an effect that everything is is getting down. Now that's for weird. the maximal values, and that's we weird. have. We okay. wrote a, we wrote a paper uh, where we showed that in hyperbaric hypoxia the maximal heart rate is even more decreased than in normal baric hypoxia, you know? Hang on. Few, so how, few, few bits per minute. As I, as I was trying to say, and I was obviously wrong, I assumed you get to the same maximum heart rate and, and maximum cardiac output, but you don't. Now, do you know why that is? Uh, yeah, because probably there is some uh, uh, oh, limitation uh, to protect the, the heart, to protect the different uh, function. Okay. Uh, but an interesting point is that at some maximal value, your heart rate is increased. Yes. So if I just, if I'm pedaling at 150 watts, yes. my heart rate will be higher. But if I'm going to my peak power output, my heart rate is likely lower. Oh, and okay. coming back to the oxygen uh, consumption at the same power output, you will have about the same VO2. So the efficiency is not that much modifier. Maybe a little bit in some condition, but efficiency is not that much modifier. And it's okay. a common mistake to believe that efficiency is changed. That makes sense to me. Because if you're doing the same work, you need the same oxygen to do the same exactly. contractions. So you're doing the exactly. same contractions, you need the same oxygen. But that's going to be need to be at a higher heart rate, a higher ventilation. Yes. Okay. So that's when and they've then, gone and there. Then clearly, clearly it's, it's, uh, it will be at a higher relative intensity. Because yes. my max values are decreased, you know, 
Beautiful. Okay, so that's something I really wanted to talk about. So it's good that we introduce that now because some of my questions I want to ask you, like the relative. So, so just so people know, if you're exercising on a bike at 100 watts, that might be 50% of your VO2 max normoxia when you're breathing normal oxygen. Well, believe it or not, I actually did a study with this. We looked at activation of AMP kinase. We did three different trials, 50% VO2 max, which is like 100 watts, for example. And then we did the same um, exact workload. So same absolute workload. But as you said, it's a higher relative workload. Yeah. So we, we did the same workload with hypoxia. And that ended up like about 70% of yes. the hypoxic VO2 max. And then we, as a third, we had them do 70% at normoxia. So you could have the same absolute and relative. I know that's a classic thing. And then we looked at activation of AMPK and glucose uptake. So that's important because I'm, I'm going to want to ask you about that. So when people are doing training, so for example, I might even ask you now. So if, if people are training at the same relative intensity, all right? So, okay, my, my question is, I sort of got, I was told some, some, some people at AIS years ago that part of, why they people go to altitude is actually a placebo you may have seen that in the notes i sent you and I, i'd like to ask you about that so i'm wondering how much of the effects you get when you um live uh live high and train low yeah are actually the altitude and how much of it is because um when you train is harder do you know what i mean so yeah, if you yeah, do the sure. same training at yeah. sea level versus yeah. at altitude uh, yeah, so, mm -hmm. it's a key question because obviously there's no point to use altitude or hypoxic training if it doesn't bring any any additional benefits. So we are not investigating if altitude training or hypoxic training is effective. We are questioning: is it more effective exactly. than the same training content in normoxia? And it's a it's a key question. Uh, the placebo effect is is a bit a joke. Because uh -huh. uh, obviously, when you are uh, in Samoritz or when you are in Colorado Spring, you know that you are in Colorado Spring. But it's mm -hmm. this point is does not dismiss is not is, obviously we can we it's a bit theoretical. It does not dismiss the effective physiological adaptation that are induced by altitude. So um, there are some studies where they try to uh, argue that uh, altitude training was only due to the placebo effect. Uh, I'm not hey, clearly. I'm sorry, not on dog, this on this dog, side. My dog's barking. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm not going to imply that. But but I guess yeah, I but, guess uh, where I first uh, heard about that was um, so for example, some Australian sort of rugby uh, players and Australian uh, rules players and things they go to like altitude. And then like months later, they'd be saying, oh, you know, that altitude training was, was great, but they only went for like a week and it's like months later. So, so, and I've heard some coaches saying, that's fine. Don't yeah, let them think that because if they, you know what I mean? So yeah, I'm not yeah, trying to placebo, diminish that at all. But, uh, as a coach, placebo is one tool that you can use, obviously, you know, as exactly. I know. And, and we know that the very good coaches use placebo effect in many, many ways, not just about environmental condition, but on, on a lot of different things. So it's not a... Uh, but, for me, it's not uh, something that uh, we can't use on the field. As a scientist, it's something we have to take into account. And it's very important that we can obviously uh, discuss if altitude training is only due to placebo effect or if there are effective physiological adaptation. So if we come, if we come back to the, the leave high, train high, 24 hours a day, obviously what we know is that about 100 hours of altitude induce 1% increase in your hemoglobin mass, total hemoglobin mass. So total hemoglobin mass, you can measure that with CO rebreathing. Mm -hmm. It was a method that was developed by Walter Schmidt. And, uh, you know, it's used now uh, worldwide at the AIS. They have the um, Chris Gore and uh, his group. Uh, they have used the uh, HB mass uh, measurement with CO rebreathing method for long. Uh, so there is a consensus that if I spend 100 hours at the real, at the, at the right altitude, it's probably between 2,200 and 2,500. Okay. I would get 1% increase in my HB mass. And okay. if I want a, if I want a real effect of this HB mass increase, I need at least two to three, two to three percent of increase. That means you need 
200 minimum or up ideally 300, 400 hours. So eight days would be, so four days would be 100, 100 hours, yeah? So you're saying four, eight, 12 days minimum. Yeah, yeah. To see 13, days is, 13 days is a minimum and ideally we expect three weeks, four weeks. Oh, sorry, four uh, weeks, it's, it's, four days to see anything at all, like 1%. But you're saying you need 3% or so to see any yeah, sort of Yeah, 3% is minimum, is, three, is uh, about two weeks, but we, we recommend three weeks and up to four weeks. In terms of only these classical mechanisms, you know, okay. what was expected since the 60s. Since the 60s, we are looking to altitude just for about increase in the red blood cell mass, increase in the HB mass, and increase in the oxygen transport, improvement in the oxygen transport capacity. But it is at the convective level. It's about the transport. We have also to discuss what's going on at the peripheral level. Mm -hmm. Is long uh, altitude exposure, is it really inducing an improvement in the oxidative capacity in the muscle? Ooh, okay. It was, so, thought, it was <laughs> thought like that for long. It's not the case. Okay, you need perfect, exercise. Perfect. You Sorry, need if I exercise. can just say... Um, Yes. So, so you're saying you need the exercise to get those peripheral effects. So if I can just explain, so the body's trying to help with its oxygen delivery. So what it does there, as you said, after say 12 days or so you get, or, or 13 or 14 days in a, is you'll get uh, a bit of an increase in your red blood cell count. So then you can carry more oxygen to the periphery. And then you're saying the other thing you can try and do is the mitochondria, which I'm assuming most people would have heard of in the muscle is what you know uses the oxygen so one thing you can try and do is increase your mitochondrial volume to then so so what are you saying there you, you said yeah you but it takes exercise. it takes very long it takes very very long exposure so it's a, the the time course of okay increase ventilation change in the plasma volume change in the hemoglobin mass and then change in the uh, mitochondrial density or biogenesis or capillarization this Excellent. would occur but after months of altitude. months months yes okay. so you don't okay. expect so much change in the capillarization or mitochondrial biogenesis you know with effective increase in the mitochondrial um, density after just a few days or few weeks in altitude and mm. on top of that it has been shown that you need exercise it will boost this peripheral adaptation you know, That's for great. long, for long, it was thought that uh, just staying in altitude would get a massive improvement in your oxidative capacity. That's not really the case. It's very. That makes sense, right? Because if you think if you're just sitting there at rest, who cares if you have to maybe ventilate a bit higher or whatever? You're not actually really challenging the muscle. But if you're yeah. exercising, you know, and you're challenging, I assume the intensity makes a difference yeah. as well, that you'll have greater adaptations to the to the mitochondria. But it because... also makes sense. It takes time. Yeah. Yeah, because when you when you exercise and the highest the exercise intensity, the largest the effect, you will accumulate the deoxygenation that we can measure with near infrared spectroscopy. So your muscle will be hypoxic because of the hypoxic condition, but also will be more hypoxic because of the deoxygenation induced by the exercise. So you accumulate two way of um, deoxygenation that would that may induce larger adaptation at the in the muscles perfect okay so you've we've been talking mainly about uh live high train high yeah so that's where you go and live there whether it's you know permanently or weeks and months um so so do you want to just tell us a bit more i know we started at the, at the start we touched on it but the other as you said it's mainly been live high train low yes the, the different combinations and i know you also i saw in one of your papers there's also the live low, train high, which is yes. what, what you're really interested in, yeah. So in the 90s, uh, Ben Levin, Professor Ben Levin from Dallas and uh, Dr. Jim Stregnerson from uh, Park City, they came with a new idea that uh, if I have a, uh, an altitude exposure that is long enough, sleeping high, I would get this benefit in terms of the oxygen transport and convective factors. But if I train lower, not necessary at the sea level, because the first study was they train lower in um, Salt Lake City, that was about 12 or 1300, mm -hmm. you get a better uh, quality of training because I'm lower than I can do interval training at a higher velocity and so on. Then I would combine the physical 
the physiological uh, benefits of living high, but the so you're driving up and down benefits of of training at a better and at a higher exactly. intensity. And they've shown in this paper that was a paper published in '97 in Journal Applied Physiology by uh, Ben and uh, Jim. They show that uh, uh, after a few weeks of leave high, train low versus leave low, train low, or a third group leave high, train high, they had a larger performance enhancement in the leave high, train low group for the same increase in VO2 max. The two groups who stayed in altitude, leave high, train high, and leave high, train low, they had the same increase in VO2 max, but when they measured the performance over five kilometers, you know, running yeah. uh, uh, like test on the track, yeah. they had a larger improvement in the leave high, train low. That means that the translation from physiological adaptation to performance was better in the leave high train low group. And it was a very uh, clever idea. And it has changed the way uh, the people train at the elite level worldwide. Now, everywhere, you know, I was in Japan at the Japanese Institute of Sports Science uh, two or three weeks ago. You go to the IIS, you go to the INSEP, you go everywhere in the world, you have some sleeping room for sleeping in altitude. But mm -hmm. What we believe is that we, you need to combine sleeping in altitude and sometimes training in altitude. So that's what we call leave high, train low and high. Yes, yes. So, so why don't you just explain, expand on that a little bit now. Um, so so yeah. to summarize so the there. Yeah, sorry, the third yeah. family, you know, the third family, we talk about leave high, train high. We talk about leave high, train low. And these two Methods are mainly for the endurance athletes because the main factors remain the improvement in the convection, in improvement in the oxygen transport, improvement in the hemoglobin, you know, increase in the hemoglobin. If I want now to discuss the third family that we call leave low, train high, that means I just go in a chamber or I take a cable car if I am in Switzerland, and I will do my session in altitude. But just the exposure to hypoxia is very short because I will be there one hour, two hours. And that means that if there is any benefit of leave low train high, it is not due to the hematological adaptation because you need 100 hours for 1% mm -hmm. increase. Mm -hmm. So that would be improvement in the diffusion or improvement in some um, molecular adaptation in the muscles that can be in the vessel, in the microcirculation, or that can be directly in the muscles, mitochondria or some um, uh, excitation contraction properties and so on and so on. And then the leave low train high is something that is really, really of interest. Uh, we have different way. We can do low intensity interval training, repeated sprint and so on and so on. Um, and it can be combined with the other one, with leave high, train high, and leave high, train low. Um, so, but just to, to, to make it simple for the, for the people who are listening, the main assumption is that if I do leave low, train high, few sessions training high, don't expect any improvement in your VO2 max. Or okay. if the improvement in VO2 max occur, it won't be coming for improvement in the convection, it might be improvement in the diffusion at the peripheral level. Okay, so this, then, is, uh, this is, sorry, this is talking about uh, living low. So just, just living like you would normally if you live at sea level. Yeah. And then you're actually training in, obviously you go up to, you know, go up or you usually you just go into a situation where you've got a way of getting low oxygen. Chamber. A yeah. mask or a chamber. So you, yeah. as you said, you're just going in there for a, who knows an hour or two, whatever. So you're not going to get that effect, as you said, of an increase in red blood cell mass, et cetera, hemoglobin mass. So you're getting other effects. Now, this is where I'm interested. So you're saying that the I'm interested in all of it, but I mean this this thing about um the training. So you so just say I'm just here at sea level and then I go and train as hard as I can doing repeated sprints or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then so I mean, um, okay, not repeated sprints as in... Um, I can dis I can explain the first yeah. study on repeated sprint and hypoxia if you want. So I, right. It will be, it and will whether, be, I think... Okay, and whether you, I would end up better 
by yes. going into the hypoxia, even if I train at the absolutely the same, you know, uh, RPE, um, you know, the intensity. Yeah. Okay. Great. So uh, yeah, ten years ago, uh, we we started uh, to investigating this one of the leave low train high methods that we call repeated sprint and hypoxia. The first study on RSH was published by one of my, of my PhD student, Raphael Face, in uh, 2013. So it's exactly 10 years ago. Here we had one group who trained eight sessions of 40 minutes. So the total exposure is very short, mm -hmm. doing three sets of five sprints. You know, very short session, three sets of five 10 second sprints. Yeah. One okay. group in hypoxia, 3,000 meters simulated altitude in normal baric hypoxia, one group in normoxia. Before and after we test a lot of different things, we did observe no improvement in VO2 max, no improvement on the wind gate on glycolytic, uh, let's say, capacity. But we did observe a really strong and large uh, improvement in repeated sprint ability. That means the possibility to repeat high max intensity exercise, uh, delayed fatigue in the muscles. So you can do more sprint at the higher power output following RSH compared to following repeated sprint in normoxia. Okay. And that was something of interest because uh, then we had to argue, is it coming for a better muscle perfusion? let's say more blood coming to the muscle? Is it something coming, uh, for example, uh, from a faster phosphocreatine, the synthesis post the spring? Okay. Post and it has uh, had now some consequences on, on patients. Wow, okay. Now we've, we, we run some study with mice where we had mice doing repeated sprint in hypoxia and we collected the vessels and we really showed that you have a larger possibility of the arteries for vasodilates oh. and something very important to understand coming to the peripheral adaptation is this uh, compensatory vasodilation if i have less oxygen in my capillary i will have a increased perfusion to compensate the decrease in the diffusion you know we we were talking about the, the uh, alteration in the pulmonary diffusion a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Now I'm talking about the alteration at the peripheral level. So you have less oxygen in the capillary. I will have an increased perfusion to try to compensate this okay. alteration in diffusion. Okay. And obviously you understand that. And then we uh, on mice, we showed that uh, this vasodilation is effective post high intensity in exercise, this vasodilation is effective. And there is obviously some consequences on people with vascular dysfunction. Okay. And now we have some clinical study with people with peripheral artery disease, you know, we mm -hmm. have uh, alteration in the endothelial function to, to see if we can use altitude for this type of patients. Oh, that's very interesting. Just a couple of things there. So just to clarify, uh, with the the humans where they exercised uh, with the repeated sprints in normoxia so normal oxygen and hypoxia so low oxygen you said yes. they, they they improved their ability to re do repeated sprints was that at normoxia so normal oxygen yeah the repeat the test in uh, the test of repeated sprint was in normoxia okay you know, most of our study we we are not so interested about using altitude or hypoxic training for improving performance in altitude it's exactly. obvious, you know, because exactly. you are better acclimatized, you will be better at altitude. Yes. But we are, you, we, are, we are investigating using hypoxic altitude training or exercise for improving sea level All right. uh, performance. And, and, so, and, that, and that was, they, they did the same relative intensity, yeah? So it was just as hard. No, it was sprint. Both. It, was, it was maximal Flat intensity. Out. Ten, okay. ten second sprint. Fantastic. All right. And, and then, then this, you know, this study... Uh, has uh, led to a lot of different studies. So it was 10 years ago. Now you have more than 60 studies on RSH in the literature. Wow. Uh, let's okay. say uh, maybe 25 from my group, but also people in Japan, in New Zealand, in Australia have been working on that. And most of them, they have confirmed that do, during high intensity exercise in hypoxia does not induce the same molecular adaptation, the same performance enhancement, um response than 
repeated sprint or high intensity exercise in, in normoxia. That's very and it has led mm -hmm. to a very, uh, a lot of application. I have had one PhD student with a Welsh rugby. Okay. Where the Welsh rugby, you know, very strong team. Uh, in, in 13, 14, uh, he was head of performance. We had repeated sprint in hypoxia with professional rugby player. We had prof we had repeated sprint in hypoxia with hockey player. We had a, mm -hmm. a lot of different sports. And uh, now if I summarize, repeated sprint in hypoxia is used by a lot of different sports, intermittent sport, racket sports, combat sports, team sports. Yeah, so that's interesting because, yeah, as you said, at the start, people were tending to think about endurance exercise, but now this is for intermittent type exercise. So just to bring back to that mouse study you said you, you did. So you found with them, they had greater vasodilation. So that means that yes. the blood vessels are opening. So that's another way of trying to get more oxygen in there. So you, you're yes. actually dilating. Now, that was during exercise. So that was greater blood flow during exercise. Now, we, with the mice, uh, we didn't measure the, the blood flow. We we just collected, you know, they did four weeks of exercise. So after that, we collected the arteries. Oh, the isolator, uh, yes. 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 And then, you know, you have different technique where you can Dilators. put uh, different uh, vasoconstriction uh, or vasodilation yes. uh, substance. Okay. You, know, you put uh, like uh, uh, Dino or you put... I understand. Uh, you so know, you're saying it's acetyl, actually acetylcholine and then yes. you check what can be the response. You, maybe you're familiar with these different. Yeah. Things. Yeah. So it's stuff you, you can do, you can, you can, you can give this acetylcholine, as you said, you can see if that's like a, a nitric yes. oxide, which is causing exactly. the dilation. Yeah. And you can also give other agents to see if it's the muscle. Is it the muscle or is it the endothelium? And you're saying it's the endothelium, which yes. becomes, you say you get improvement in your endothelial function. So you have, and you that, have an improvement. Yeah, that and I critical. want to add something mm -hmm. because you mentioned your interest about nitric oxide. We we thought that it would be mainly uh, by the the nitric oxide uh, pathway, and that was not that clear. Probably there are some other uh, vasodilatory substances or or factors uh, that is not clear exactly. Is it if the nitric oxide synthase pathway is a main trigger or not okay. at that stage? All right, well, that's interesting. So yeah, so so what you're saying there is you're you're starting to talk about health implications, which is where we're gonna we're gonna head because you're saying that by exercising the in their hypoxic conditions, the, the repeated sprints, they actually got an improvement in their kind of resting. I know it was an isolated vessel, but the idea is that they've got a, a resting better function of their blood vessels, and we know that that's important for for blood pressure, uh, you know, for even like insulin's ability to to yeah. cause blood flow in the muscle, et cetera. Sure. So this is really important. So yeah, I guess with these um, these health uh, bits and pieces, we're, we're going to talk about this a bit more later, but did you want to talk about, you know, seeing as we're sort of going beyond the sort of, you know, what people tend to think about, it's just, you know, the red red blood cells and whatever. Okay. What, what did you want to say about some of the work you've been doing, looking at low oxygen and even high oxygen, which is like the opposite, and and look at sort of health health effects of that, you know, pros and cons of these treatments. Yes, so if we talk about the potential uh, benefits of using hypoxia for um, health purpose or therapeutic purpose, now we are working on the uh, what we call hypoxic conditioning or hypoxia hypoxia conditioning. So people here that can be with moderate exercise or it can be at rest, they just uh, alternate few minutes in hypoxia, but it's a very severe hypoxia, like 11% or 10% of oxygen. Mm -hmm. And three minutes, few minutes in hypoxia, that can be 30%. I just uh, remind the, 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 the people who listen that the uh, oxygen level is 21%, 20.93. So it can be few minutes at 11%, few minutes at 30%. Mm -hmm. And it has already in the literature some benefits uh, regarding cerebral function. It okay. is slowing down some neurodegenerative symptoms, like in Parkinson. It has some benefits about the vascular function. It's probably uh, mediated by some of the mechanisms we, we just discussed before, you know, and it has some benefits regarding the body composition. Uh, because one of the questions is, is also altitude. We know altitude induce an increase. If I stay in altitude, let's say passive exposure to altitude, I will have an increase in my leptin. 
and mm -hmm. leptin modulate the appetite, you know? Yes. So I will have a decreased appetite. So it, it might be also used for uh, people overweight or, or it's something that is very clearly shown when you go to extreme altitude, like for example, mountainers, when they go to the mountain rest, one of the risks is that they don't eat enough because mm -hmm. they have this large decrease in appetite. For people overweight, you can use a bit of the similar mechanisms uh, uh, with the leptin uh, increase uh, that is well documented and the decreased appetite level. And obviously, the the idea is to lead to a decreased body fat. Okay, and, and is that is that with you were saying hypoxia, but you were also saying yeah. alternating. Is that right? Yes, like alternating between. So you're saying even alternating between hypoxia. So you're saying like, uh, you know, eleven percent oxygen when it's normally twenty one, and then you alternate to hyperoxia, which is like thirty percent. How uh, how many times do you do that, and how how, you know, how many so sessions, how many up and downs or whatever do you get, yeah. and then you get left. So you have you have a, you have a different uh, protocol. We just start a we just start a protocol with hypertensive subjects. So at rest, they will have. Three minutes, thirty percent. Three minutes, eleven percent. The study is not is not done yet, but uh, what we do expect with them is to have them with a lower uh, systolic pressure. We want okay. them to have a, to to have this uh, normalization in the uh, in the in the blood pressure. That's that would be mediated by some of the mechanisms, you know, vasodilation and so on. Uh, yeah, um, it is really it is very really promising because it's something easy yeah. to do, uh, and uh, it's something that can uh, be um, an alternative to the medication, or it can lead to a decrease in medication. You know. Yeah. So if they're hypertensive, which means high blood pressure, and they're on yes. medications, for example, you're saying this treatment might mean they could. Uh, reduce their medications which is which yeah. is great and uh, the main the main uh, patient that could benefit from this uh, different hypoxic hypoxic conditioning methods are elderly hypertensive subject pad subject and people with neurogenerative disease so that are the main focus of uh -huh. of our work now so the pad is peripheral you know, arterial and, uh, disease and Yes, peripheral artery disease. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a direct, some of them at least, it's a direct consequence of the work we've, we started with uh, repeated sprint in hypoxia. Wow. You don't expect hypertensive subject or people with PAD to do sprint. It doesn't make sense, you know. It would yes. be even dangerous. But we just want to uh, see if there is some alternative to the only method used so far that is medication and low-intensity exercise. So that's really interesting. You were saying that, that the hypoxia can cause increased endothelial function, which is the, helping to increase blood flow, which is important for dropping blood pressure if you've got hypertension. But you're actually saying the high oxygen, the, the hyperoxia, can also have a similar effect. Is that right? Uh, not alone. With but when you alternating, alternate. Yes, the alternating uh, hypoxia, hyperoxia, it is just that you will play with a large... A shift in the oxygen supply. Okay. You know, we have to remember that as mammals, oh, the oxygen uh, delivery regulation is a key factor. Uh, you know, uh, the professor uh, Semenza, Radcliffe, and Kellin, a few years ago, they got the Nobel Prize about the discovery and the investigation of the I on the IF1 alpha. Uh -huh. uh, okay. these transcriptional factors. They yes. didn't get the Nobel Prize because they were interested about performance enhancement in, in endurance athletes. They got the Nobel Prize because if one alpha is a key factor in so many disease, if well, you have the cancer, mm -hmm. if you are anemic, if you have you know a lot of pathology, the if HIF1, the if family one or two is really important. And if you look to PubMed, you will have thousands of publications on HIF. Few of them in my field, exercise, but a lot of them about cancer. Yes, yes. We've actually had previous podcasts where we've talked about HIF 1 alpha. And it's interesting because it's hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha. So you, th you would think, oh, it's only activated by hypoxia, but it's activated by lots of things. And it's similar when I had, um, uh, ooh, 
uh, Paige Geiger on talking about heat shock proteins. They are activated by uh, things other than heat shock, but it just shows how complicated things get. Um, the other thing I thought I might bring you back to something because you're talking about another sort of health um, way of m manipulating hypoxia was your, what is it, VHL. Do you want to explain what that is? Oh, yeah, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. The hyper, so it's, uh, That sounds really hard to me. <laughs> uh, VHL uh, is at the abbreviation for hypoventilation at low lung volume. So obviously, just keep in mind that if I want to get any hematological benefits, I need a long exposure. But if I do repeated sprint, the duration of exposure doesn't count. What is important is the quality of the sprint and mm -hmm. a high level, the severity of hypoxia. So we started a few years ago. Uh, again, the first publication was from my group by, uh, by Laurent Trinca. We started to simulate repeated sprint not using hypoxic facilities, but in, we, we induce a deoxygenation and desaturation by manipulating the breathing pattern. We, we can, it's a bit difficult to explain exactly how to do it, but if you change the way you breathe during the sprint, you can induce a desaturation down to 80% of saturation that, that correspond briefly to what is being observed at 2000 meters of altitude. You know? Yes. Well, I, I just thought I'm an asthmatic. I'm a chronic asthmatic and I have inhaled steroids morning and night. I've also had a bit of long-ish COVID. I'm about seven weeks now and I've still got uh -huh. crap in my lungs. Okay. And for me, for the life of me, I cannot imagine. So it sounds like what you're saying is you, you have low volume. So you breathe out a little bit. You're just breathing at low volumes. You're purposely so breathing. It's, uh, yes? we, we, change, we change the way we breathe. You have some uh, one phase of apnea some uh, large then uh, full um, it's i can't explain exactly oh, okay. the technique Sorry. like that it but the like consequence the consequence is that if i induce hypoxia by vhl and i do repeated sprint i might have some benefits close to what i can do with rsh alone like repeated sprint in hypoxia it's an alternative we call yeah, that yeah. the hypoxic I for looked... the poor Oh, for, okay. for the people who have so, who have no yeah, access so just to... just to summarize, even though I don't know exactly how you do it, the bottom line I guess is that instead of having you know the poor part, so instead of having an altitude tent or something, to and then having low oxygen in there, you actually give yourself low oxygen by yes. by breathing less. Breathing exactly, and that's the thing that stresses me out because I can't imagine breathing less because often I feel like I'm not getting enough. So it's, and then it's, and uh... then actually doing sprints on top of it, but you've had people exactly, do that. but uh, you're, you're completely right. If you just have a long apnea with full lung, you don't have enough hypox hypoxic stimulus. If I do uh, apnea with empty lung, I can't do the exercise. You could, you could do the exercise if you, know, you have an apnea and you have empty lungs. So you have to find a way like a compromise that makes possible to do the sprint and to induce the hypoxia. And mm -hmm. then we did measure that it, it was first with deoxygen uh desaturation with an oximeter and after that we've been we, we did measure in the muscle deoxygenation with the near infrared spectroscopy and we did calculate if there are any performance uh, benefits and that was the case so we've done some study already in rugby player in uh, swimmers in cyclists and it is not optimal but it is a good alternative okay Perfect. All right. You, so, you get me? Do you get me? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. It's the poor person's, uh, you yeah. can't say poor man, it's poor person nowadays. So, okay. <laughs> so if we go to Twitter, you, I, we talked about this earlier. We had a couple of people that sent um, some questions. Yes. I can't read without glasses. Um, so Angela Davies, who's been a good, she's sent a couple of uh, questions, a couple of other podcasts as well. Yes. Uh, she was saying this will be useful for her course. Um what did she say there? Oh, that was about mitochondrial biogenesis, vascularization, hemoconcentration. Okay, so we've touched on that. Now, we've also got uh, Pierre, Pierre Paquette. I'm Paquette. sure I'm saying that Pierre wrong. Paquette. Paquette. Yeah. Yes, so he said, basics. What is the impact of changes on al in altitude on the physiological data of an athlete? So we've talked about that. What yes. types of training are recommended at altitude to improve the VO2 max? Uh, we've... Ah. So I can, I can discuss a bit that. 
uh, it's been um, it's been shown that if I do interval training in altitude, what we call IHT interval inter, uh, intermittent hypoxic training, uh, and I want to uh, do like uh, three minute three minutes interval that is shown to be quite or five minutes five minutes that is shown to be effective mm -hmm. for improving VO two max at sea level in altitude it is it is not so beneficial because it's this type of oxidative or aerobic exercise or interval training, you will have the a large effect of the hypoxic stimulus. So the oxygen flux, the oxygen flux to the to the mitochondria, to the muscle, will make impossible to keep the same power output. It's impossible okay. to do three minute, three minute interval at 3000 meter at the same power output that what I can do at sea level. It is not the case for repeated sprints. That's why repeated sprint is uh, effective because if I do 10 second sprint, I can do 10 second sprint at the same output at 3000 meter than at sea level. That's why you have this uh, bit of differences. Okay. So, but what if and you that's, were... that's why that's why we don't recommend to do interval training for VO2 max improvement purpose in altitude. Just do it at low altitude or at sea level. Ah, I see. I see. That makes sense. Okay. And then there was a question and in, in uh, the same person again, in terms of sports nutrition, is the effect of gels and other sports drinks the same as at altitude? It's a bit of a tricky. Oh, no, it's a, it's, it's a very good question because we know from the work of uh, Brooks and so on in the, uh, in Pikes Peak that uh, you have a shift in the substrate oxidation. When you go to altitude for the same intensity, Mm -hmm. You will have a larger carbohydrate oh, and uh, let's say uh, uh, glycolysis. You have a shift also to glycolysis. So that means the risk to be uh, to have an hypoglycemia is higher in altitude. And you have to increase the CHO uh, intake, the carbohydrate Perfect. intake. If right. not, uh, it, you know, if I'm talking about the crossover point by Brooks and Mercier, the crossover point will be shift. Uh, in altitude. So you will get this crossover point at the lower intensity than what you would get at sea level. Yes, yes. So that's the classic. We haven't actually touched on this, but that's the classic thing. When you go to altitude, you're exercising altitude, you have higher uh, adrenaline, for example, and that stimulates yes. glycogen breakdown, stimulates yeah, liver glucose exactly. output. Yeah. So you're using more carbohydrate. And as we know, so it's just another nice thing to touch on, that it's actually more efficient oxygen-wise to use carbohydrate, you need to use more oxygen to get the same ATP from fat than you do carbohydrate. So it makes perfect sense that yeah. the body would use more carbohydrate, but I guess it means it's going to run out sooner. So then the question was a good one, as you said, to sure. supplement. And, uh, mm -hmm. If I want to complement a bit, you mentioned the adrenergic responses. I think one of the one of the key issue to manipulate in altitude or to, to take into account in altitude is the sympathetic activation. The sympathetic activation that can be at a risk factor, you know, if I have some, uh, if I have, a, if I'm a, I, with hypertension and so on, and I go too high too quickly, it might be dangerous because you have this sympathetic activation that is larger in altitude. That's why when you when we use uh -huh. hypoxic conditioning in this fragile population, we are using intermittent pattern and. Uh -huh. Sometimes we yes. expect them not to sleep in altitude because we know that sleeping in altitude, you will get a erratic breathing pattern. It will be more at risk. If you are obese or if you are hypertensive and you sleep in altitude, it might be you might have ap ap uh, sleep apnea, apnea, hypopnea, and that might increase the adrenerg adrenergic responses. Okay, so so there we're talking about you know people know about adrenaline. You know, we just touched on it. The adrenaline rush you get when when you're out as us being hunter gatherers. So we're out picking berries, and a lion jumps out. We get this adrenaline rush. We sprint to the tree, but that yeah. actually is going to put up your blood pressure, as you as you say. Yeah. And and yeah. and the fact that you have more sympathetic nervous system, which stimulates the yeah. adrenaline release, actually you know can can be not good for someone with high blood pressure you're saying yeah. um, but yes. but but when when we do high intensity exercise in hypoxia you might induce some sympatholysis that means some mechanism that would blunt partly this sympathetic activation if not you know it wouldn't make sense to have this uh 
uh, vasodilation that we were talking about, if you have this strong effect of the sympathetic activation, because uh, sympathetic activation increases the vasoconstriction, that would be the opposite. So depending of which type of altitude, the severity of altitude, how long you stay there, which type of exercise, you can have very opposite effect on the vessel, muscle, and cerebral function. That makes the topic quite uh, challenging. <laughs> wow. And the other thing I know is with the, I guess it's all uh, the level of the hypoxia and the level of hyperoxia, because, you know, in your paper, you had a nice uh, uh, figure where you were saying if it's mild hypoxia, you get these effects. And if it's obviously if it's high, same with hyperoxia, because I know if you have high oxygen, and this is one of the things, you know, people would know about um, hyperoxic um, treatment sometimes, you know, for, for injuries and for, for various other things, you do get these increases in free radicals, yeah, which yes, exactly. can be damaging. Yeah. Do you want to just touch on that? I know it's not exercise, but just touch on the fact that at either extreme, these things can obviously be negatives. Yeah. But then, I think, yeah. yeah. I think the, the ROS, the reactive oxygen species, can be a, a strong parameter uh, that can be used by altitude and also by hypoxia. That's something uh, we, you probably you saw in our publication. We've been working uh, on this uh, oxidative uh, stress or this... Uh, pro antioxidant balance and uh, it's something that is uh, that has a, a str uh, large clinical application so overall we can say that altitude will increase the oxidative stress but again there is a different time course between the pro and the antioxidant uh, that is the defense so the oxidative defense uh, so we have uh, we have several parameters, you know, some of them MDA, uh, nitrotyrosine, uh, AOPP, whatever, you know, uh, glutathione peroxidase. We have a lot of parameters that we can we can investigate. Uh, and uh, again, it's not that simple because depending of which type of exposure, how high you are, is it intermittent or continuous? Which level of exercise you might have some um, uh, specific responses. Uh, yeah. It is something we are investigating now with a, a study with a preterm born subject, you know, that we That's put right, on the uh, preterm, premature, prematurely born. Uh, prematurely subject. born, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, first we thought that they would be more at risk going to altitude. And finally, it is not that clear because well, probably because they have been on hypoxia and hyperoxia at birth. They might have induced mm. some specific responses, but not necessary to have them more at risk in, in altitude. Yeah. It's a study we it's a study where we are doing with a, a colleague in uh, Slovenia, Professor uh, Tadej Dubovic. Uh, that's okay. a nice study because we bring the people to the Mont Blanc. You know, we really bring the people uh, to a high uh, altitude refuge. And uh, they stay there for three days, and we we measure different things, including the uh, oxidative stress. Yeah, I mean, one, it's interesting, as you said, because um, I saw in your paper the mild hypoxia, so low oxygen, and the mild hyperoxia, high oxygen, they both increased antioxidants. So people would know the antioxidants, you know, like vitamin C, vitamin E. It's it's yeah. it's funny that they they both have the same effect. So I guess it's just because it's a it's a stress. And you respond with an anti-stress response. That's adaptation. Yeah. It's, that's, 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 the, that's, the that's the basic mechanisms of physiology. You yes. adapt. Yes. If I stimulate one function, I make this function stronger. You know, that's the principle uh, behind uh, physical exactly. activity. So right? even though they're opposite directions, they're both a stress. Yes. So yes. you respond similarly. Yes. yes. And, and then the other that's thing why, uh, that's why uh, playing with hypoxia is is quite interesting because it's a uh, uh, fundamental mechanisms of life, as including for, for us, you know, at the different age, you have different level of oxygenation in the brain, in the different uh, tissue, and we might have a, a stronger adaptation if at some point in life you get exposure to this stimulus. That's what we call the hormetic principle, you know, mm -hmm. hormesis, hormetic principle, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Exactly. I mean, literally, I was sitting out on the balcony today and it was like a tiny bit warm, but I, I'd never think about putting the air conditioner on inside. It was fine. 
yeah. But then I noticed drip, drip, drip. The person above me was at their air conditioner and it's like, it's not even warm. So it's actually good to be a little bit uncomfortable, you know, a bit cold, a bit hot, a bit hypoxic, a bit, you know, it's, it means you can, the body can actually have something to, to respond to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, if you look to the work of uh, Tipton, Professor Tipton is talking about also same, uh, same principle about thermoregulation. It's not always, it's not perfect for our vessel of our, of our cardiovascular system to always be at the same temperature. It exactly. might be good to be, and you know, you have already all this uh, practical application about cold water, and heat, uh, exercise, and so on and so on. Yeah, it's about, and, it's, yeah. Another, it's another uh, environmental factor, but it's about the same mechanism, same principle. Okay, this has been great. Now, what I thought I might do just to finish up again is go back to your, because I saw one of your papers that was really interesting. I think it was just accepted in medicine and science, sport and exercise. The one where you did, you were looking at the, the aerobic sort of versus the anaerobic sort of balance of doing, you know, five second sprints and then 10 seconds yes. rest versus 10 seconds and 20. Do you want to just explain that one? I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, sure. So it's uh, something uh, we believe is very important because we, we, we introduce uh, RSH, repeated spring training in hypoxia, but you have different type of repeated spring. You have some type of repeated spring that can be mainly oxidative and some of them that can be mainly glycolytic. So if Obviously, we can say mainly oxidative is mainly aerobic, just for people so using yes, oxygen, yes. yeah. That's and then the glycolytic because you have a, lo a very small recovery. So you know, if I do uh, with a small recovery at and I repeat sprint, uh, I will have an increase in my VO2. But if I do, uh, let's say, twenty second sprint, it will be mainly glycolytic. And the principle is that if I expect hypoxia to have any specific influence on my repeated sprint, it makes sense that it would be mainly if my oxidative glycolytic balance is okay, you know, is uh, not too oxidative, not too glycolytic. And uh, that's something we, we've been discussing in this paper. Uh, it is something really of interest for coaches. You know, we have, uh, we, we have some uh, contact with elite coaches and they uh, understand that you can induce lots of different adaptation by using high intensity exercise in hypoxia. Okay, fine. But playing with the exercise recovery ratio and the amplitude between exercise intensity and, and um, recovery intensity. That's something, uh, it makes another uh, piece of complexity in the, in the equation. <laughs> And uh, another thing of interest is that probably in that case, we didn't measure, we didn't have biopsy, but probably people who have more slow twitch fibers might benefit or might have a larger uh, influence of hypoxia on this type of session because the, the fibers are more oxidative. So they are more influenced by the uh, change in the oxygen supply. Okay. Do, you, do you get me on that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so fibers are more oxidative, so better using aerobic uh, yes. and means then to get energy. Logically, hypoxia is a stronger influence. Yes, and then that's they, why we mm -hmm. we don't believe that uh, having uh, at least for improving repeated sprint ability, we don't believe that having uh, twenty to thirty second sprints might be uh, beneficial. It might be useful if you really focus on the, on improving the uh, lactic uh, tolerance, lactate tolerance. You know, it's, right. again, you know, it's a, you, you might have different purpose. You just have, I, I was a coach, you know, as you, as you, yes. as you mentioned at the start and you, you have some a session that you focus on, on improving your aerobic power. Some session you focus on improving exactly. your glycolytic capacity and you can use hypoxia for different purposes, but you don't use the same type of repeated sprint or interval training. And it also, it depends on what you need, right? So if your VO2 is already pretty good, then you might work on something yeah. else. If you, if, yeah. Now, how about, we've talked about a lot of things here. How about we try and summarize things? So if you're, if you had a team sport, so an intermittent exercise type sport, what sort of sessions, so just say, you know, as a coach, someone's a team sport person's come to you, you know, the Welsh rugby players or whatever, what would you suggest to them um, to do? Yeah, so well, we can take the uh, we can take the example of the Welsh, of the Welsh rugby. They did uh, in Cardiff some blocks of repeated sprint in the hypoxic chamber, 
and after for the World Cup in 2015, and they came ag again in 2019, and they will come again for the next World Cup in 2023 in, in, Par in France. Mm, France. They do some leave high, train low and high. Because a rugby player, a football player or whatever, they need to have a good aerobic mm -hmm. capacity. Not, no, they don't need to have uh, 80 of the auto but yeah. they need to get... Because especially on the long tournament, you know, it helps the recovery, it helps the fitness, it helps the immune defense and so on. But on the same time, their specific quality is about repeated high intensity, repeated tackle, repeated uh, fighting, you know. And um, <laughs> It's not fighting, something... it's, it's, it's malls and rucks. We, 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 we're not going to call it fighting, I'm just joking. Malls yeah, yeah, no, and it's rucks, just, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, but that means, uh, and you know, if you observe, for example, in professional rugby, the duration of, of one action, it has improved, it has increased a lot in the last 20 years. It's not the rugby player now are not the same. Even the top five, they are not the same than 20 years ago. Oh, yes. They have to be there early. They have to, they, they can't be late, you know, when you have the mole. And, uh, and they have to repeat that. And there is a strong effect of fatigue. So if you combine having long exposure, living high, high quality training, training low, and doing some resistance repeated training sprints. or repeated mm -hmm. spring, you might have a very good At altitude. combination. That's right, with low oxygen. Yeah, so just to clarify, so you live, so when you say live high, train low, and high, so you're living high, then you get those uh, benefits that you, in more the traditional type ones people think of, maybe the increase in red blood cell mass, whatever, hemoglobin mass. They train low because they've got lots of oxygen, normal oxygen. They can train hard. But then you also top up with the stuff you've been talking about during the repeated sprints or the resistance training with low oxygen. Exactly. Correct? It's, so and high, then after low, that, high. Yeah, every sport has to find the perfect combination. You know, I'm not, I'm not somebody who can tell a professional rugby coach, you have to do this exercise. I can introduce some principle. And after that, every sport has his own needs in terms of repeated, repeated the, the high intensity actions and uh, level of uh, oxidative, glycolytic, repeated sprintability qualities. So it's quite interesting. That's why we've been some, uh, we've been working in the last 10 years. You know, I mentioned that, uh, RSH was developed in our lab uh, uh, like 10 years ago. Uh, we've been working with a lot of different sports. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to have this exchange with coaches because they also bring some new ideas. Yeah. And even as you say, it's complicated because even within, I mean, a lot of people don't know rugby that well, but even within the rugby, you've got the fullback that's going to be more standing around than sprinting. You've got yeah. the the breakaway or the yeah. the, fl the flanker who's is running the whole time. So even within sure. the team, obviously, this is different. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's why you can use a different type of uh, high intensity exercise in hypoxia depending of the position of the guys. Yes. That's, right. Uh, so that was a team sport. So what about if we go back to sort of where it all started? So if you're an endurance type athlete that yes. came to you and wanted to know, you know. What, what do you think I should do? Again, it depends on their level. Yes. And I think they, they need a repeated prolonged exposure to altitude. That means uh, some lots of professional cyclists now, they have a hypoxic chamber at home. They sleep yeah. on a regular basis at, at, uh, 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 in altitude. You know, a few years ago, uh, we had the CAD 11s. When yes. he won the Tour de France in 2011, he did leave high train low in Switzerland. And we did advise, uh, we did advise him about using altitude but it's a classical method of, of altitude you know cyclists uh, they want to have a high aerobic power they can combine also we've been working with some professional cyclists they combine leave high train low and repeated sprint just sprinting at the top of the call you know it's just another way to use it mm -hmm. because at the top of the mountain yeah at the top of the of the pass yeah mm -hmm. and uh yeah, again, uh, when we started repeated spring, we thought it would be only and mainly for team sports. But now we know that a lot of endurance sports, cross-country skiers, professional cyclists, they use also some, at some part in the season, some repeated spring in, integrated to the traditional methods. Oh, actually, I'm because, just thinking about something else. Who's that famous guy? I've just forgotten his name. K Killian. Killian Journey. Yes. Now, Kill I heard him interviewed the other day. 
And he, even though he was brought up at altitude, he now lives at like four meters or something, you know, like at sea level. Yeah. And he finds he doesn't really need, he feels yeah, like he cool. doesn't really need to do altitude training to be, yeah, to, yeah. to race at altitude anymore. What do you think? Yeah, Kilian uh, uh, grew up in the mountain, in uh, in the Pyrenees. He, he was using a lot of altitude training, but now he's, he's, he's in um, Norway at sea level. Sweden? No, Norway. Oh, okay. Sorry. He, oh, his wife's Swedish, but he lives in Norway. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> okay. he, he lives in Norway, so he lives uh, at sea level. And uh, he doesn't need so much altitude. When he did prepare, we published with him, uh, when he did prepare for the record at Mount Everest, he used altitude for that. He uh -huh. did some bit of live high, train low and high. He was sleeping in an hypoxic tent. He mm -hmm. was in Norway, sleeping in the hypoxic tent. And he was using the mask system for doing some interval training on the treadmill. So it was live high, yeah. train low, and high. Right. And that's Perfect. why uh, I was interested to analyze his training content and discuss with him. Another thing that was of interest for us was that he, he felt that he was uh, the, the transition from normobaric hypoxic training because he, the tent and the mask was normobaric hypoxia. Before to go to the Mount Everest, he felt that he needed a transition using hypobaric hypoxia. So okay. he spent a week in the Alps to be in the real altitude Perfect. condition. Perfect. So that's two points that was uh, that were of, of interest for us because that's two points we were advocating: live high, train low, and high, as I did explain, and also the fact that you might acclimatize in normal baric hypoxia mm. and not be so effective in hypobaric hypoxia that's why we had this publication together and mm. i still uh i'm very grateful to kilian that he was openly sharing his uh his training log and everything with, with me now i'm not an expert on altitude uh training i think we've made that clear during this discussion <laughs> so i wonder i was just wondering and i i've, I've started adding to this to the podcast of of whether the, some of this stuff is controversial so is is everything we've talked about pretty much uh you know agreed on i'm I'm sure in science there's always some controversy yeah, yeah. um i wonder if you can discuss that a yeah. little bit so we we had we had different uh contrasting perspective or you know we had one against uh against you know our opponent was professor richelet about hypobaric normobaric hypoxia and we had a very interesting one with uh, 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 uh professor Dempsey. Yes. Uh, Demse uh, is a big name, and I have a lot of respect for uh, uh, Jerry Demse. Uh, mm -hmm. He was advocate. He was stating that altitude would uh, lead to many uh, opposite or side effects. In our view, he's right, except that let's say he was mentioning uh, sympathetic activation, or he was mentioning uh, uh, alteration in the sleep. That's true, very true. But except that we don't recommend the athletes to sleep at 5,000 meters, 6,000 meters. In our view, the altitude that we do recommend 2,500 meters after a small phase of acclimatization, these side effects are not apparent anymore. And the benefit about hemoglobin mass, the benefit about oxygen transport, and now the benefits about high intensity exercise and peripheral adaptation are very clear. You know, yes. that nobody, nobody would discuss that spending time in altitude improve your oxygen capacity. Nobody would, would, will discuss. We had now 60 papers on RSH worldwide. No, very few papers don't bring any additional effects. So, and the, the, the topic is how I combine what's going on at the con at the convective level and what's going on at the peripheral level and i think it's you have a lot of combination i think it's very nice because you know you said at the start or maybe it was before we even started you said you know 40 years working in the same area but obviously you've branched out you've got the health impacts you've got you know brand new types of you know high low high that you've developed and uh, happy to say that you've actually mentioned two people that we've had on the podcast already so ben levine was on talking about the heart and exercise and oh, yeah, yeah. talked about his hypoxic stuff and um jerry dempsey was on, to, on talking about oh, okay. uh, so, the, the lungs and exercise so uh, so it's a it's a privilege to follow this uh <laughs> this giant huh? and uh, i know you have a prestigious name in this podcast and i'm i was very uh 
you did convince me to participate I because did. I'm not I'm not a big fan of podcasts. You know, we have so many things on internet, but I think your podcasts are of are of the highest quality among uh, the one um, I. I I know so far. So thanks for the invitation. Well, I'm very pleased you came on. We were joking about it initially, but but um, I asked if you'd come on. You said yes, and then you said actually no, and then you then I, then I sent you the list, and you said oh, okay, yes. <laughs> so and also you came on at very late notice, so I had someone pull out. So thank you very much for coming on. Is there anything thank else? You. Is there anything you wanted to talk about that didn't come out? Anything else you're excited about, or have we pretty yeah, much covered I'm, everything? I think I think the, the most exciting um, avenue for us is about the health benefits yes. of altitude. I don't want to say that there is no risk. Obviously, altitude is, is additional stimulus, additional stress. But we can manipulate this stress for health purpose. And I did mention in this podcast about some work already that we are already doing with PAD patient, with hypertensive patient, with elderly patient. And... Most of them, sometimes you have some surprise, but most of them, uh, we get very uh, interesting outcome and beneficial outcome. That's great. Okay. Well, thanks again for your time and I'll see you around. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Nice and, to meet uh, you too. I will okay. listen to your podcast now. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you. Okay. See you. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, please like, subscribe, pass it on to your friends and colleagues. Check out the other podcasts. Thanks again.